Hey, hi everyone. I'm William Smith, a Partner Program Manager with Jamf. I am not a software development engineer, and likely most of you are not either, I'm guessing. Uh, most of us are administrators, consuming software that helps our end users consume their software that they need to do their jobs. We happen to sit in a position between software developers and our end users that can give us a perspective into kind of both worlds. Software developers create products that we use, and we give software developers feedback about their products, hoping they'll make them better to use. Likewise, we administer our end users' computers and software in an effort to facilitate their work, and they respond to us with tickets. And this is not advancing. There we go. Not a software developer, administrators. They respond to us with tickets, something that we all love. Now, tickets are quite often the only way that we allow our administrators to, uh, to communicate their problems with us. Uh, does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. I hope we can agree that uh, whether you're a software developer or an administrator, we share the same goal of trying to craft and improve the end user experience. I want to talk to you today uh, about what you already know as an administrator who delivers a product to consumers, which is, in other words, your support that you provide your end users, and give you some perspective on what happens on the software development side by explaining how a feature is born. My goal for today is to help answer some questions or address some thoughts that you've probably had like these. Why don't they add my feature? It should be easy. The software is only half-baked. I don't know why I'm paying to beta test their software. Has anyone ever thought that? <laughs> Does anyone have any thoughts about these questions or something similar, similar questions before I start? It's in the backlog. It's in the backlog. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. All right, to show some of you what a software developer might be doing when planning features for a product, I'm going to use a tool that they might use to track their progress. So think of my presentation today as a product I'm delivering to you. What we have up here is called a scrum board. It's a whiteboard with a lot of sticky notes, quite often hundreds of sticky notes. Now each column represents a phase of progress with everything starting in the backlog. Now, if a feature is chosen for development, its progress is tracked from left to right until it's done. Today, most scrum boards are electronic. Now, the first items that go on a scrum board are themes or epics or stories. A theme is a really big story, an epic is a smaller group of stories, and then story is usually something that ends up representing a specific feature. I have five epics for you, and they all follow this format that I'm showing on the screen. So first, I want to tell you about my experience working with different software developers. As a presenter, I want you to know that I have experience with a few companies that have developed software, so that you, the audience, will have some confidence in what I'm getting ready to talk about later. Now, I'll add some st uh, story points that I want to cover in my experience. I'll use yellow sticky notes for those. And next, I want to explain a couple of methodologies for developing software. They're not workflows. They're not processes. They're not project tracking systems. Instead, they are frameworks, beliefs, or core sets of values that, that have been around for more than a couple of decades. It's important that you understand each one so that you've got a foundation for understanding Scrum later. I'll put my story points for these methodologies in orange sticky notes just to make things a little bit easier to see. All right, so what is Scrum? This is probably the most common methodology that follows something called an Agile framework. I want you to understand what Scrum, uh, how Scrum works and its core principles. And then there's a group of people who work together. They're called the Scrum Team. A Scrum Team is what makes Scrum work. We're going to look at the people who make up the Scrum Team and see how each member plays a role in taking a concept from its first expression uh, that's first expressed as a story, 
then defined as a feature, and finally developed into working software. And the last epic that I have is really about you. As a consumer of software, you likely want to get your feature requests turned into working features. You've invested time into learning how a software title works and behaves, and you'd rather not have to change to another product just to get a specific feature, especially if that product doesn't have the features that you're currently using today. I'll wrap up with what you can do to influence software development. As we proceed through our work, we update the Scrum board to show what's in progress, so let's get started. I'm going to take my story points over to another board where I can go into each one in detail. Now, my first experience with software development was 25 years ago. I worked for a company called Fleming Foods. Fleming was a food wholesaler, which is where hundreds of grocery stores across the U.S. got their groceries to sell to their customers. I supported the advertising department, about 75 people, and each week we put together grocery store ads uh, for all the stores. Hundreds of four-page, eight-page, or more full-color advertisements about produce and meat and dairy and deli and boxed foods. They look the same today as they did 25 years ago. Now, my boss was the director of advertising technology. He envisioned an automated system that could take electronic templates and automatically build 90% of these ads. So he paid a developer a million dollars just to do that. They said that to meet all of their requirements for this project plan, that uh, it was going to take them probably about a year to build this software. Now, during that time, my boss put the thumb screws to these guys and show, uh, to, to show some value as quickly as possible. He didn't want to wait a year just to see the software. So over that year, the developer's project manager realized the complexity of that project and what my boss was demanding, and there might have been a little scope creep in there too. It turns out the project manager was holding everything together by a thread, and then that thread snapped. He left the company, and later the developer eventually sold our business to another developer that already had a product, but it couldn't do half of what we wanted. Unfortunately, we didn't have a choice. Uh, to sue anybody would cost more than the million dollars that we actually had already paid, and we'd still have no system. So we learned a few lessons from that. A customer can't wait a year to realize value for their investment, and there should be transparency to the customer in the work that's happening. A few years later, I worked for another publishing company, which I'm going to call Company X because they're still around today. Company X specialized in producing financial documents such as annual tax reports. If you've ever invested in stock or mutual funds, you've probably received some of their work. The companies we serve had legal obligations to print and mail these books to every shareholder. They're full of financial tables and charts, and our job was to make them look pretty and then to print them and get them mailed out. But we also had to be very careful of typos because these documents had to be compliant with the Securities and Exchange Administration, the S uh, Commission, the SEC. Uh, incorrect information could lead to a reprint, which means another mass mailing, which was very, very expensive. We used Cork Express 6 and lots of custom extensions. And I recall that one of the extensions was more expensive than the cost of a Quark license itself. We, can, uh, we contracted with an extension developer called ALAP to create our custom and highly specialized software. And upgrades to anything were seen as kind of a point of failure to this company. So once we had a working Mac OS X production platform, all software was frozen. And for three to five years, those systems weren't upgraded. No Mac OS upgrades, no Quark Express upgrades, no extension upgrades, nothing got upgraded. Again, three to five years. And then when we couldn't buy refurbished Macs to support our systems anymore, that would kick off a very expensive one to two year project to upgrade all the software and all the computers again. And it would happen again. 
Now, during one of those periods, Cork bought ALAP. They now own the code to our custom extensions, but they had no desire to continue our custom work. We didn't see that coming, and we had no way to upgrade and no legal recourse whatsoever. So, lessons learned. Don't treat computers like appliances. And it's cheaper to invest in more frequent updates rather than long-term projects. Now, is it fair to say that everyone here has heard of Microsoft Office? All right. This story point's pretty interesting because it's about a software development success called refactoring, uh, which means to change the structure of the code without changing the functionality. It's like changing the design of the engine of a car without changing the design of the car itself. But this is also a software development warning that I'm getting ready to talk about. 25 years ago, Microsoft released Office 97 for Windows, and it took 46 floppy disks to install on your computer if you weren't lucky enough to have a CD-ROM drive. Now, a year later, they released Office 98 for Mac. Then they had a quick upgrade to Office XP for Windows, and a year later, Office 10 for Mac, which was the very first version of, of the Office suite that supported Mac OS 10. And then they released Office 2000 for Windows, again followed a year later by Office 2001 for Mac. And the releases followed that same cadence for the next several years where every new version of Windows that was released about every three to four years followed, was followed by a version of Mac a year later. And the Apple community had grudgingly come to accept that the new version of Office would always come a year later and always with fewer features. But for 2016, the cadence changed. So what happened? Microsoft developed the Office 97 suite and the Macintosh business unit at Microsoft always had to wait until it was complete before it could start work and port the Windows software over to Mac. And that's why it was always a year later. On top of that, the Mac boo was releasing Mac-only features. And now the code bases are starting to diverge away from each other. And this went on for 10 years until Office two, uh, 2008, they said, this, this doesn't make sense anymore. Why are we doing this? So with that release, they started converging the code bases. But it took them another 10 years to move back toward each other. And then what was released for Office 2016 was actually a common code base for the first time in 20 years that they could use not only for Windows and Mac, but for iOS and Android. So lessons learned from that. Dependencies like having to wait for the Windows version to ship, that can delay value to other customers like the Mac customers. And then doing your own thing can lead to technical debt, which means there's a cost to not fixing problems right away. And technical debt is expensive to pay off. It took Microsoft 10 years just to do that. Now, I've been with Jan for a little more than seven years. It wasn't until I started working there that I had a better understanding of what uh, software development or how software development works. I'm about to say some things that folks might find controversial, and I want to be clear up front that I am speaking as myself, not a representative of Jamf. I have no control and no, no insight over anything to share on their behalf. My opinions that I'm getting ready to say are my own. So on Jamf, we have a feature request, on Jamf Nation, a feature request that's been open since 2015. It's requesting that we add support for a choice changes XML file when installing a package. If you're not familiar with this feature, it's a command line option that lets you check or uncheck installable options. In the case of, my, of the Microsoft Office installer, for example, I can choose to deploy the full package without installing OneNote or OneDrive, for example. It's a really handy option, and it's got over 200 votes. And there's a little tag that said reviewed, which means somebody at Jamf has clearly read this feature request. Even Monkey has support for choice changes. Deploying a choice changes file with a package, they've had it for years. But why hasn't Jamf implemented that feature? Here's my opinion. It's not worth it. 
The value to our customers would get, uh, that our customers would get out of this feature is minimal compared to the value of other features that we could be implementing. More than once I've asked customers, how many installers can you think of that have custom items that you can check or uncheck? I've personally never been able to think of five. I know of Microsoft Office, uh, Cisco AnyConnect, McAfee, all of which our customers use and they have very heavy presence, but I personally can't think of many more installers that offer choices. I would imagine our research has also found that not many packages offer choices either, and while it's not a baked-in solution, Jamf Pro does support running scripts that could support choice changes. It's not a great option, but it is an available option. And remember that Monkey is mostly command line tool. It's easy to code a solution when all you're doing is writing text. But to implement a feature like this in Jamf Pro also requires creating an interface. Now, as a customer, what would you expect from that? Would a simple field where you can paste in the XML work? Would that be enough? Or what if you don't know how to write that XML? Wouldn't it be nice if Jamf Pro could read that package that you're uploading to it and then extract those choices for you so that you could, uh, all you had to do was just select what you wanted to check or uncheck. Oh, but that requires writing some more code. Um, and because Mac OS has the only command line tool that can extract those choices from a package, it's not going to be so easy because Jamf Pro only runs on Windows or Linux. Now, maybe Jamf Admin could do that too, but it's been deprecated. So implementing a feature like this would take more development time than most folks realize. And when it's finally in the product, how much use would it really get? So lessons learned, what sounds like a simple feature may, be heavy, may have heavy requirements to implement and a lot of time and effort. We should implement only those features that will yield the highest return of value for our customers and then don't necessarily implement a feature because you want to be feature complete. Finally, let's look at what we've all seen with Apple. This is a fantastic ex uh, example of today's software development methods. In Mac OS Monterey, we got erase all content and settings. Hallelujah, love it. Um, but why did it take so long? Especially since iOS has been able to do it ever since it's been around. So here's part of it. Apple used to deliver new operating system updates about every two years. Then, in 2012, they moved to annual releases. It was with El Capitan in 2015 that they started making significant changes to the operating system. Here's a slide that I made for a blog post a while back, and it gives a chronological overview of what happened that led up to erase all content and settings. So, how many of you remember Rootless? What is system, system integrity protection? Back then it was, it was, oh no, I'm getting ready to lose my ability to manage all of my computers. And that didn't really happen, it wasn't that dramatic, but it was extremely important because it was just a step in a series of steps that had to happen first. But what products, uh, but what's important to understand is that each year offered customers more and more value. It wasn't just six years of hidden development leading up to erase all content and settings. We soon got a new and improved operating system that later supported the erase install option with the start OS install command. Mac OS Catalina and Big Sur made installations more secure by separating the operating system from the user data and then cryptographically signing the system volume. And only with all of that in place could we then get erase all content and settings. Now, I've left out a lot of other contributing factors, but we can see Apple had a long-term vision here. Customers don't get to see that long-term vision until after the fact, and it's usually in hindsight, and I'm sure there's a lot more to come that we won't see for a few years. Now, they could only have accomplished this by releasing more frequently and showing short-term benefits in addition to the long-term vision that they, uh, 
that, uh, of everything combined. So lessons learned. Changes are rarely arbitrary and standalone from developers. Making a feature like erase all content and settings takes a lot more work than you probably can think of. And then executing a long-term plan should still show short-term benefits. Now, whether working for, working with, or simply using the software made by those companies, I've learned a lot about bad practices, good practices, and some cold hard facts about developing software. So here's a recap of what I learned. As consumers, we don't expect to pay for software today and then receive it later. If we're buying custom software or paying a subscription to use software, we expect it to continually improve over short periods of time, adding new features and fixing bugs. We're no longer patient to wait for new features every two to three years and then bug fixes every three to four months after that. That's what used to happen 10 to 15 years ago. Developers have moved from project management to product management. That's what the rest of my presentation is going to cover. So let's start with an understanding of a couple of methodologies and explain the differences. Now, how many of you have ever been part of a formal project? And what I mean by that is you were part of a project group that had a project manager and there was a deadline to complete the product. Any of you? A few of you, perfect. Uh, what you likely experienced was the waterfall methodology of project management. This is a traditional methodology that's uh, not just for de uh, developing software, but delivering any kind of project, whether it's designing a new computer, remodeling a kitchen, or maybe the entire house, or sending someone to the moon. And the bigger the organization, the bigger the bureaucracy. And here's what that methodology might look like. And it makes sense on the surface. The first part of your project begins with defining the requirements. If you've ever been part of a project, this is a really, really interesting at, at first, until you have to sit around for several hours listening to everyone else's requirements that really have nothing to do with yours. Now, can anyone tell me what happens during this phase sometimes? Everything plus the kitchen sink gets thrown in. All right, so next comes planning. Do we have a deadline that we have to meet? Uh, who owns the project? What are the dependencies? How much is it going to cost? Can we eliminate some of these requirements? Someone then has to take all of that and they have to decide what the product's going to look like, how it's going to function step by step. Software engineers are then handed the designs and told, here, make this. And once everything is fixed, and again, when the whole project is finished, the owners test, they find bugs, and they send them back to be fixed. And then once everything is fixed, the software finally gets released. Now keep in mind that when you release, this is when you see the value for the money that you've invested pay out, but only at the end. So, the stakeholders, who are generally directors or vice presidents, they love this methodology because they see a solution coming and when it's going to be in their hands. They can predict things. They can promise, promise things to customers. They can plan budgets. But what happens when something in the waterfall changes? Let's say you've already written some code and you're in the middle of bug fixes and the requirements change. That means all your planning, designing, implementation, and testing are all at risk of being partially or completely thrown out the window. You've already spent part of your project's budget. There's only a few things you can do. You could ask for more money to complete the project. You could ignore the new requirements and then just delay them until version two that's going to come you could remove the un unimplemented requirements, the stuff that hasn't been built yet, and try to wedge in the new stuff. Or you can literally scrap the entire project and cut your losses. And it's not just with changing requirements. Maybe your planning was faulty, and you have to change that. Or the design doesn't work as expected. Or the developers misinterpret what the design was during the implementation. 
Changing the product before it's released introduces the possibility of higher cost, lower value, and greater risk. Not to mention you still haven't received value from actually releasing the product yet. I mentioned bureaucracies a little bit ago. NASA was known for its phase gate process, kind of a project management on steroids. They went through phases during discovery, scoping, requirements, documentation, development, testing, and finally launch, literally. Every phase had its own series of meetings, planning, strategizing, and sign-offs before the next phase could even begin. Then in the early 1980s, Fuji Xerox came to study NASA uh, to learn about their phase gate approach, and they wanted to implement this back in Japan. But what they discovered was that their quality dropped. Failure rates went up and delivery tanked. They quickly, they quickly went back to their own way of doing things. And it turns out, as big as NASA was, it was introducing a lot of delay and a lot of risk in its programs. And can anybody recognize what this is? Can you tell me what it is? A Gantt chart. Which it, uh, a Gantt chart is something that you're going to use for planning or tracking a, a project's progress. You might call it a project roadmap sometimes. It was named after Henry Gantt, who invented it in 1910, more than 100 years ago. This is 100-year-old technology that many projects still rely on today. There are problems with roadmaps, the biggest of which is a map is not the terrain. While it may show you the quickest way to get from point A to point B, it's not going to do you a good job of showing you the height of the mountains or the depths of the oceans or the ruggedness of the land between you and your destination. And there's a military saying that goes, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. In other words, the moment you start your plan, it's anyone's guess how it's going to end. And if you think about it, the worst time to make any prediction about how or when a plan is going to end is before you've even started it. Yet, this is how many projects are managed, and the organization's leadership is making promises to customers based on these plans. Now, but have you ever noticed that the bigger and more complex a project is within an organization, interestingly, the more likely it is to succeed? Anyone know why? That's because that's what upper management wants to hear. And that's what the project owners are going to tell them regardless of whether it went over budget, whether features were cut for time or money, or more valuable features that could have been implemented were delayed until version 2. Standards are often lower at the end of a project than at the beginning. So what's the alternative? This is where a shift in thinking happens from project management to product management. No longer is Microsoft Office for Mac developed as Office 2004 with new features, later redeveloped as Office 2008 with new features, and then redeveloped again as Office 2011 with new features. Instead, the major, uh, the major version number froze at 16.x back in 2018, and it has incremented each month from 16.9 back then to 16.75 today, and its product name is just Microsoft Office, or Microsoft 365 if you're uh, subscribing. Now, the product suite hasn't been developed as a project for five years, more than five years. And thanks to Mac OS iterating each year, third-party developers have been forced to find ways to iterate their software a lot more frequently. Or they lose market share, they get out of the market, or they simply die. The methodology that supports product management and more frequent, uh, more frequent releases like I'm talking about is called Agile. Agile is a philosophy, and what I'm showing up here on screen is the, manifest, uh, the manifesto for Agile software development. This is everything that defines Agile right up here. Anything else that you may hear about Agile software development is just commentary. Now, this was written and signed by a group of software developers back in 2001. 
They called themselves the Agile Alliance, and uh, they were an alternative to documentation-driven heavyweight software development processes like Waterfall. It says they have come to value four things. First, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. In other words, let's not put something between you and me. Instead, our team and the product owners should routinely meet face-to-face -face so that we have a common dialogue and we can clarify any kind of misunderstandings. Second, working software over comprehensive documentation. That means don't give us pages and pages of documentation about what you want. Instead, we'll take the story you give us from our conversation and start there. And as we develop the software, we'll keep meeting face to face and refining it. Third, cust customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Contracts that define what developers are going to deliver are usually more than 50% boilerplate just for legal purposes. No one reads them, yet everyone signs off assuming somebody else has. Getting feedback from a customer during the development process, process is far more valuable. And then finally, responding to change over following a plan. Plans are not perfect, especially at the beginning. We'll discover things along the way. Let's develop iteratively uh, with each other and constantly check our work so that we can course correct as we need. And the final line of the manifesto says, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. In other words, we're not throwing out the old way of doing things, but they do have their place. In addition to the Agile Manifesto, they also wrote 12 principles to support it. I'm not going to read every one of these, but I'll point out a couple that I think are pretty interesting. I love the second one in the middle column. The most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Again, the paperwork, get the paperwork out of the way. We understand your needs better when we can see each other, we can talk with each other, back and forth questions and answers, body language, facial expressions. These all convey meaning much better than emails or project websites will ever do. And I really like the second one in the third column. Simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done, is essential. This isn't saying develop the bare minimum, but it is saying don't overthink it and don't over-engineer it. If you haven't picked up on it, agile development is all about creating a feedback loop between the developer uh, development team and the customer. And it's about making that feedback loop as quick as possible. A tight feedback loop mitigates risk during development. Jeff Sutherland, who's one of the creators of Scrum, which I'm going to talk about shortly, provides an acronym, OODA, from his military experience as a fighter pilot, observe, orient, decide, and act. This fairly well describes what an agile development team does over and over. It's programmed into their way of working, and as soon as they act, they're already observing again. Now, can anyone think of a similar example or workflow of something that, that follows this type of process? I was going to be disappointed there in a minute. All right. So I hope you see why agile product management is favor over waterfall project management. When a project comes to an end, it's done. But a product is always improving. So here's a recap of what I just covered. 20 years ago, developers determined that waterfall project management was failing them and their customers. So they put together a simple list of ideas for how to work smarter, the agile manifesto. Since then, it's been the backbone of product management. Uh, and remember, agile development is a philosophy, not a process. What I'll cover next, though, is a process not only used in software, uh, in software development, but by schools, militaries, and governments for all sorts of products. As administrators, I encourage you to look into it. Remember, your services to your end users are your product to them. So let's talk about Scrum. This is the agile methodology that you'll see 85% of product management 
teams using today. So what is Scrum? What does it mean? Anybody have any ideas? You seem like you've got one. No? It comes from rugby. Yeah. A scrum is where teammates, rug, uh, teammates, on a, uh, teammates on a rugby team pack together tightly, what I'm showing you here, to try to gain possession of the ball. And of course, the goal in rugby is to try to move that ball down the field and score. Teamwork. So we'll talk about scrum teams and how they work in a little bit. But first, it's important to understand that scrum is empirical. It's fact-based, evidence-based, and it's transparent. Um, does anyone think a software developer, coding management software like Jamf Pro, my, my company's product, has ever been an administrator? Not at all. When a coder picks up a task, they don't have personal experience to draw from. They actually rely on somebody else to decide what's the next important thing that they should work on. Now, there is a person who makes those decisions, but I can almost guarantee you that person has never been an administrator either. And they don't have your perspective. So can anyone think of what they use to decide what's important? How about feature requests? This is formal feedback from customers through a portal where they can aggregate and they can deduplicate suggestions. And there's some more here. They have customer interviews and focus groups. In other words, asking the customers not necessarily what they want, but what they think, which aren't necessarily the same things. Customer weight. It's true that a single customer with 100 software licenses will have more weight in the decision-making process than 10 customers with five licenses each. That's 100 licenses compared to 50. And in this case, money talks. They look at subject matter experts. These could be customers who are well known and trusted in their communities. Maybe they're outspoken. They're solutions builders. There's discussion boards. Customers don't always give feedback directly to the software developer. Sometimes they like to make their opinions known in public with their colleagues. And a good developer will embed themselves in the community and they should be open as to who they are, that they are there and present. Finally, app metrics. Every time you launch a Microsoft Office app, it phones home and it ticks up a number. Someone's just started using Excel or Outlook. Your company network can block that communication, but if you're at home or if you're not running something like Little Snitch, that ticker counts up. The information is anonymized, so they don't know who just clicked up that ticker, but in aggregate, it tells them how much software or how much their software is actually getting used. And developers can't quite get this information. They can, they can actually get this information down to the feature level. So for example, someone just created a new style in Microsoft Word. Now, internally, as part of the development cycle, which is typically two weeks, but usually not more than a month, the developers themselves have a meeting where anyone in the organization can see what they've just accomplished. They show off their work and anyone's allowed to give feedback. This is like the behavior that the Roomba exhibits when it hits a wall. If what the developers uh, have put together doesn't jive with what the product owner was requesting, this is their time, again, to observe, orient, decide, and act. No one gets blamed for getting the code wrong this is just how course correction works. And getting feedback incrementally through the development process is far better than waiting for that finished project to release next year and then finding out that's not what the customer wanted. Now, how do these empirical data points, these facts about how customers use software, get translated into work for developers? And the idea is pretty ingenious. Developers receive stories, and stories will get refined over the course of a development cycle so that developers get a clearer and clearer understanding of what the customer wants. Now, I said earlier, understanding what customers think, not what they say they want, is more important. And here's an example of what I mean. 
A parent is getting ready to bathe their small child, and after they've measured the temperature of the bath water, they begin helping the child into the tub. The child tentatively dips their toe into the water and immediately pulls it back and screams, make it warmer. The parent pull, uh, puts their hand into the water and they're thinking, it's already a little bit warmer than what my child really likes. Then they realize, make it warmer to an adult means increase the temperature. But to a child, it might mean make it closer to the temperature that I know of as warm. Stories are a great way to relay to developers what a customer is really looking for in a feature. Customers don't tell developers, I need you to build credit card fields that capture my credit card number, the expiration date, and the verification code. Rather, they tell the developers, I want to pay online. So what I've been showing you on all these green cards in the upper left-hand corner are the stories that follow a common format for relaying information to the developers. I've been using that format to relay each of these stories that I want to tell you about how a feature is born. As a presenter, I want to show my audience the Scrum methodology so that they'll understand the de how development decisions are made. And remember, agile thinking, Scrum, and stories aren't just for software development, they're for product development. Administrators could take stories like as an end user in accounting, I want to delay software updates so that I can complete end of month billing cycles on time to recognize revenues. The story is telling you the problem. It's not telling you how to solve the problem. That's for the developer to do. Now, all the stories follow this form, not all the stories follow this format, but at the height of agile development, uh, at the heart of agile development is something called Scrum. Stories convey much more meaning than software requirements. And then when stories are ready, they go into something called a backlog, which is nothing more than a pool of work. It's like a big task list. And as stories get prioritized, they move up in the backlog higher and higher until they're next for development. Now, some stories like that, choices, that choice changes XML file uh, might remain in that backlog for years. And they're going to just keep getting other features more and more prioritized over it, they may never move up. Now, if the story is the heart of agile scrum development, the sprint is the machine that makes it work. A sprint is a period of time that commonly lasts about two weeks, but not more than four weeks. It's purposely time blocked. It doesn't grow longer or shorter depending on how much work there is. Instead, it's a way of forecasting how much work can be accomplished over a period of time. Here's the basic structure of a sprint. Let's say it runs from Monday of week one through Friday of week two. And at the beginning of the sprint, the development team meets for something called sprint planning. This is where the developers themselves review the backlog and determine how much work they can complete during the next two weeks. Each story has a definition of done associated with it. And done means working software that improves the product. It doesn't mean what you and I would consider a full featured software, but instead it could mean I can pick up, I can click a button and send a command to a computer to install software, and then I get some feedback. Now that feedback might look something like this. Error 01011, packet overrun. So keep that in mind. Now every morning throughout the sprint, the team meets for a 15 minute daily stand up with their scrum master. Each developer says what they've completed, what they're going to work on next, and what's blocking their progress. It's the scrum master's responsibility to remove anything blocking their development. On the last day, they might have two meetings. The first is the sprint review, which is a ceremony where everyone in the organization is invited to attend to see what's been accomplished. Each developer demonstrates their working software and the stakeholders have an opportunity to give feedback. If what they see isn't what they wanted, the developer isn't blamed. Instead, attendees have a discussion, face-to-face -face conversations, and a new story is added to the product backlog for a future sprint. And the last meeting of Sprint is called the Retrospective. 
This is where the team itself meets to discuss anything that went wrong during the, the prior sprint and what can be improved. It's the scrum master's responsibility to take those improvements and implement those starting with the next sprint. All right, but what about that error 01011 feedback? That's not great. So in a later sprint, another story might pop up saying something like this. As a network administrator, I want to better understand the feedback that I received when sending a command to update the software so that I can remediate errors. Now combined, these two stories take more than two weeks for a developer to finish, but separately, each one can be done within a two-week sprint of its own. And now, I can tell you the, the estimated amount of time to finish a feature is one month. And it's going to be finished in one month unless other stories in the backlog receive higher priority during the next sprint. Now, once a sprint is complete, the work goes into the production build of the product and it gets released. So if you've ever wondered why a feature doesn't seem fully baked, sometimes uh, this is why. What you're seeing is a normal development process where a product is improving over short periods of time, iteratively. That's a benefit of the design of Scrum because customers will naturally provide feedback on what they see in a release, even if it's not full featured yet. Their comments are converted into stories. Those stories go into a backlog for work where they're going to get picked up by development in a future sprint. If development happened the way it was done 20 years ago, customers would still be waiting two to three years for new features before they could even use the software and give any kind of useful feedback. So contrary to what customers might think about software developers, there's definitely solid thought that goes into the process behind how they release new features and updates. So here's a recap of what I just discussed. 20 years ago, customers would see improvements in their software products arrive every few years. Today, Agile Development and Scrum turn that into a few weeks. The tendency is to tighten that feedback cycle even further like Microsoft is doing for, uh, with Outlook for Mac. Have any of you heard this? It went to weekly releases back in March of this year. I've spoken about this process, but not yet about the people. As administrators whose product is to support your end users, I encourage you to picture yourself in any, of, any one of the roles that I'm about to talk about. So let's talk about the Scrum team. Just like the Scrum has a defined structure, so does the Scrum team that uses it. Now, the Scrum team has three different types of members. Let's start with the product owner. They're not necessarily a technical person. Instead, they're more of a domain expert. And what I mean by that is they're, they're the most knowledgeable about the product and, or they're part of the product, and they should have a deep understanding of who the customer is and how and why the customer uses the product and how their work adds value to the product for their customers. Now the product, uh, the product owner is the keeper of the backlog and the owner of all those stories. It re they represent the stakeholders and that includes customers. So the product owner represents you. You'll hear another title called product manager. That's a different position, a different person who works with the product owner, but the product manager is responsible for the overall vision of a product. The product owner translates the product manager's strategy into actionable tasks. So product managers navigate, product owners steer the ship. And there's no product manager sticky note up here. They're not part of the scrum team. As the customer, the product owner is the person you're trying to influence when you submit feedback and feature requests. And what I think is also valuable to understand about the product owner is that that's a single person. It's never a committee. This distinction is what keeps a product moving. Otherwise, new features could get quagmired in politics and meetings, which often, never, which, which often end up diluting the value of what's, what the new feature is going to be. 
Now, a scrum master is responsible for the scrum team. They provide guidance for both the product owner and the developers, and they're very much the definition of a servant leader rather than a leader. They may also be a developer on the team, or they might actually be scrum masters for multiple teams. Their role is to guide the team through the scrum process. They run the daily stand-ups where, where they ask those three different questions of each developer. What did you do yesterday? What, do you, what will you do today? And are there any impediments in your way? If the developer says they have something blocking their progress, it's the scrum master who will take care of it. For example, a uh, developer might say that they can't find the legal guidelines for implementing credit card transactions. So the Scrum Master is going to focus on doing that for the developer while the developer continues to work on something else. And by the way, these daily stand-ups are not optional. The Scrum Master and the developers must attend. The product owner is optional to attend, but they really should attend if they're going to be part of the Scrum team. And the rest of the team is made up of individual developers, no more than about five to seven developers. Any more than that, and development productivity actually goes down. As a team, they're self-managing. No one assigns them work. Instead, during the sprint planning meeting, they'll review the backlog and decide among themselves who will take which task next. Now, ideally, each member is going to be cross-functional, they're going to have a diverse set of skills, but they'll work together autonomously. And that goes back to why, I call, why it's called Scrum, because it's the very embodiment of teamwork. While deciding the amount of work that they're going to take on for a sprint, they may use a, a method like this. Um, let's say a team might have five developers, and some of those developers are senior developers, and some are junior developers. Uh, they might decide that team members with the most experience can accomplish five units of work in a sprint. And then the less experienced junior developers might be able to accomplish three units of work in a sprint. A, a unit of work in a sprint is just an arbitrary measurement that they're gleaning from working with each other over time. There's no math behind it, really. So if two senior developers can complete five units of work, each within a sprint, that's 10 units. And if three junior developers can do three units of work, each within a sprint, that's nine units. So that's a total of 19 units of work the team estimates that they can complete within two weeks. Again, the team decides what a unit is. During the planning meeting at the beginning of the sprint, they're going to review the backlog and the highest, prior, uh, highest stories that are in that backlog. If the product owner has do, done a good job writing those stories, the developers will decide um, uh, among themselves, this story looks like two units of work, or that story looks like eight units of work. Now, to keep decision-making easy, they'll assign points to stories based on Fibonacci numbers. You might recognize this from high school math class. You add zero to one, which gives you one. You take the new number uh, and add it to the previous number, which gives you two. So two plus one equals three. Three plus two equals five. Five plus three equals eight, and so on. The numbers grow exponentially as the sequence increases. And this is to help avoid making deci uh, weird decisions about whether a story is worth five points or six points. Using the Fibonacci numbers, there's a clear difference between 5 and 8, or 8 and 13. Now, once the team hits 19 units of work, or close to it, they stop. Everything else is left in the backlog for another sprint. Now, what do you think would happen if they ever came across a story that was 21 points? Any ideas? they would ask the product owner to go back and break it down into multiple stories. There's no way that a team with 19, 19 units of capacity could ever do a 21 unit sprint or feature. Now, during the sprint, each developer is heads down on their own stories. And we could all take a lesson from the way that these folks work. 
Scrum is designed to avoid something called context switching, which is just a fancy way of saying multitasking. Developers don't work on multiple teams, and they don't work on multiple projects, and the Scrum Master ensures that outside influences don't distract them. People who try to multitask lose about 20% of their time to context switching because they have to change their thought processes. They have to write the current data that's in their brains into long-term storage, and then they have to retrieve data from long-term storage and put it into short-term storage in their brains in order to do whatever the next task is. And humans don't do that quickly. It takes time to go deep into work and to focus. So while you might think that means that they're still 80% productive, this math will show you're wrong. Yet, they're 80% productive across uh, all their projects, but they're only 40% productive per project, instead of being 100%. So don't forget, each project is taking away time from the other projects. Here's what that looks like. On the left side is how much of my time I can focus on a project. At the bottom are the number of projects that I'm working on. If I'm only working on one project, I can spend 100% of my working time, and that's as fast as I can go. But I, if I now have two projects, I lose 20% of my working time to context switching, and that leaves me with 80% of, of my working time. But that 80% is divided between two projects. So now each project only gets 40% of my time. If I try to work on a third project, each only gets 20% of my time. And I keep losing working time per project as I go. With five projects, I'm down to just 5% of my working time per project. At that rate, it's going to take me 20 times longer to finish anything. And remember, I don't see value returned from working on a project until it's done and released to customers. So context switching not only decreases my working time per project, but it delays every other project too. That means I don't see a return on my investment for a very long time. And during that time, a competitor might release the same feature and beat me to market. Or worse, I might be out of compliance with government regulations. Or maybe the need for a feature is completely eliminated in the, all that amount of time because it was surpassed by something else. I've just wasted all of my time working on it. Now you might be thinking, why not just add more developers? Shouldn't two developers be able to accomplish the same thing in half the time? Or five people accomplish something five times faster? In his book, The Mythical Man Month, Fred Brooks coined Brooks' law. It states adding manpower to a software project that's already behind in schedule is an oversimplified solution to the problem. And it could eventually lead to further delays of the project because now the developers have to coordinate with each other and they're getting in each other's way. Or sometimes you simply can't add more people. There's a couple of common examples. The first one is uh, nine women cannot make a baby in one month. Or one that I just heard the other day, if uh, at Thanksgiving you think you can, make, you can make the turkey in just an hour by turning the oven up to 900 degrees, that's not going to work either. So software developers are, are very expensive. So it makes sense for any organization to do everything it can to keep them productive. So here's a recap of what I discussed. Members of scrum teams are all equals. The product owner and the scrum master are specialized roles, but neither of them assigns work. Instead, the developers themselves review the product backlog and they choose what they will work on based on their capacity. And then during a sprint, they'll remain heads down and focused on one thing until it's done. So how does the customer, you, get in on this action? I mentioned the person you want to influence is the product owner. So what can you do to get their attention? Let's discuss, uh, let's discuss some ways to exert your influence. Software developers want your feedback. To customers, it looks very much like feature requests and product feedback goes into a black box. 
right? Hopefully it's going back into a product backlog. But by now I hope you realize software development imposes some constraints like working on only a few things at a time and limiting what that time uh, usually is to two weeks. Now in addition to constraints of Scrum, manufacturing a product always has three constraints. Time, money, and quality. You can adjust any two of these, any two of these variables, but the third will always be constrained by the first two. Usually you see this illustrated as a triangle. Inside the triangle is a fixed area, and it contains a finite amount of effort that manufacturers can put into a product without losing money. As we change any two sides of the triangle, the third side grows longer or shorter to keep the same amount of area or the same amount of effort. This is what I mean when I say that the third side is always constrained by changes of the other, of the other two sides. It's like the law of conservation of energy that says matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Or in this case, if time to manufacture a product is the most critical value, then you'll either need to spend more money or reduce your quality. You've got to make up that time from somewhere else. And constraints are cold, hard facts. There's a mantra you probably heard in business by management that goes, we'll just need to do more with less. In the short term, that means making sacrifices. In the long run, it's unsustainable. And it's just wishful thinking on management's part. So remember, software developers are empirical and they deal with facts. As customers, we should make sure that our demands, that we, uh, when we are making demands, that we're considering what those constraints are that they have to follow. So consider carefully which of those three variables you're willing to put up with and what you're going to throw out. I mentioned before that discussion boards are one place where software developers can collect data. It would be uh, unusual for any software developer today not to embed themselves in their communities and support forums and either lurk or participate. I'm not a product owner, but I definitely participate in our Jamf Nation discussions and the Mac Admin Slack, and I'm on Mastodon. Just like you, I'm trying to keep a pulse on the pulse of the community on current events. If I see feedback from customers that I think is worth, development, uh, worth the development team to know, I'm going to pass it along. But communities aren't the only feedback channels. Beta programs exist explicitly to elicit feedback from customers. But keep in mind that betas are not the time to ask for new features. The purpose of a beta is to test whether the features in that beta test are working as expected. And there will be times when how you think a feature should work and the developer thought it should work won't jive. Now, if you want a new feature, that's what feature requests are for. And keep in mind, the product owner has to convert that to a story, they have to add it to a backlog, and they have to pr prioritize it for an upcoming sprint. All that takes weeks or months or sometimes years. Sometimes it will never happen, like choice changes. Communities, betas, and feature requests, they're all open forums for you to give feedback, so use them. Now, sometimes you may not think of this as a contributing factor to software development, but it does make a big impact, and that is to keep your fleet of devices updated. The operating system affects whether you can install the latest versions of software with all the new features. If you're failing to keep up with Mac OS or iOS, then you're likely not updating your software either. And in aggregate, software developers see that. Two things happen if you don't stay current. First, the developer has less incentive to release new software if they see customers lagging behind. And sometimes new features rely explicitly on the latest available operating systems. And the other is the longer a software developer has to maintain support for older software, older hardware, the fewer resources they have to implement new features. Again, newer operating systems can mean significant changes are needed just to keep the software working. We're seeing this with the transition today uh, from Intel to Apple Silicon. Developers have to decide whether they're going to create universal binaries or stick with 
uh, Rosetta and create two binaries. Two binaries mean twice the testing that they need to do and then twice the support. And Microsoft and other developers have adopted something called an N minus two policy where uh, a while back they explicitly told customers they'll support Microsoft Office for Mac on the current version of Mac OS and only the two prior versions. And they put blockers in their installers to prevent installation on older OSs. Their N minus two policy also means that the support teams have fewer troubleshooting scenarios that they have to worry about. Anything you can do to keep your fleet up to date has an impact on what software developers can release and when. And finally, let's talk about telemetry. This is how developers automatically collect information. Quite often, you'll see this referred to as help us improve our products by sharing data with us or send anonymous data. So I told you this a while ago, but I'm going to say it again. Did you know that every time that you launch a Microsoft Office product for Mac, it's phoning home back to Microsoft, letting them know that a specific version of their product just started up. It's not sending any personally identifiable information, such as your name or your company, but it is letting them know in aggregate with other customers what their install base is and how quickly customers are updating. If you're ever suspicious about this, you have a right to be concerned, but generally the intention is sound and it's going to be justified. The software developer builds in telemetry to report back on how their customers are simply using the products. Those reports usually include the product features you're accessing and the buttons you're clicking. If you ever enable any, Office, any of Office's features like translation, which requires online access, you're automatically opting in for telemetry. And what's valuable to software developers is that telemetry is objective. It's not subjective, like polls or focus groups. I mentioned earlier, you have a right to be suspicious. You should read and understand what data is getting collected about you personally, and that could be identifiable to you. Apple, bless their hearts, they are doing a good job trying to make this process a little bit more transparent to customers. So is anybody here familiar with Mastodon and Meta and their Threads app? <laughs> Mastodon is an alternative Twitter platform, to keep it simple, built on open source software. And because it's a community project, the developers have decided not to collect any data whatsoever through their apps. Great. Now, Threads uh, is Meta's app similar to that, and it can interact with Mastodon online in the Fediverse. Thanks to Apple's privacy requirements, what they collect is disclosed before customers download the software. And we can see what the developers have disclosed about their privacy practices. Telemetry is, Im is immensely useful to developers, and I highly encourage you to leave it enabled or turn it on but only after you've reviewed their policy about what they're collecting that's personally identifiable or sensitive. These are just a few ways to influence the development process. The more active you are in participating in feedback, the greater the likelihood you're going to be heard. And here's a recap of what I just discussed. Software developers are not magic. Coding takes time and resources, and it's bound by the same constraints as any other product development or manufacturing process. What they need most is feedback from customers like you to tell them how to proceed with their work. And they have lots of ways to get that feedback, whether it's through focus groups or communities, beta programs, or other methods that they've actually baked into the products themselves to collect that data. Customers using a product give developers the most feedback because they can automate that. Just be sure that you understand what information they're collecting about you during that automation. That moves everything to done. There is one last step that I didn't include on the Scrum board. I mentioned it earlier. Can anybody else guess what that is? The developer needs to release the product. 
which is arguably the most important step because, as I mentioned earlier, they don't recognize any value from the work that they put into it until it's actually in the customer's hands. I hope I've been able to answer your questions about, uh, or answer these questions, maybe any others that you had. At this point, uh, does anybody have uh, something that I haven't covered that you'd like to go over? Alrighty. Thanks so much for coming to see me. Uh, feel free to reach out to me anywhere here or any of my ways of getting in contact, and you can also download a PDF of all of these slides from the Penn State Mac Admins site. I appreciate it.